Hello everyone, welcome to Jim Apologetics. This is, of course, your host, Jim. Today we're going to be reacting to a video posted by Rabbi Tovia Singer recently where he addressed the problem of two powers in heaven. For those unaware, Rabbi Tovia Singer is, of course, a rabbi belonging to rabbinic Judaism. He has some fame on the internet from Outreach Judaism and I think Jews for Judaism as well. His main career is essentially refuting uh, Protestant missionaries and refuting the uh, doctrine of the Trinity and especially the theology and epistles of Paul. He's published many videos and accomplished quite a bit of fame on the internet, especially YouTube, because of this. In this video, as I'll show you parts of it, uh, he has a caller request him, request of him to explain the two powers in heaven and debunk it as both these callers, both the caller and uh, the rabbi, of course, are Jewish. So we're going to look at it, we're going to react, I'm not going to show the entire video all in one, we're going to break it up and have a reaction, and I'm also not going to show every single minute of it, but the most important points that need to be addressed. So let's get started. It is an idea, they argue, that Jews worshipped two different deities based on the Hebrew Bible. I'm not kidding. It's hard to imagine they're doing this innocently. Could they really be so ignorant of the text? I don't know. But they argue, and the Christians seize this, they'd run after it, that in fact we see that there's another power that is in heaven in the Hebrew Bible that is recorded in the Jewish canon. Rabbi, what are you talking about? So there is an angel of the Lord in the Bible guiding the people. In fact, the Torah says, Hine anochi sheleach malach lefonecho. Behold, I am sending an angel. What does the word malach mean? Malach means a messenger. It means an angel. L'shmarcha baderech. To watch over you on the way. L'haviacha el amokam asher hachinoisi. To bring you to the place that I will choose. Okay, so that's Exodus 23, verse 20. So just look at the context. You don't need Rabbi Singer for this. You really don't. All you always have to do is just look up the context. Let's go to the next verse, verse 21. He shamar me ponov, be careful of him. Ushma bekoiloi, do whatever he tells you. Don't rebel against him. He will not forgive your sins. He can't forgive your sins. Uh, if we're reading the plain text like Rabbi Singer is suggesting, it actually doesn't say, he can't forgive sins. It just says, he will not forgive your transgressions. So, I'm going to get into a much better, longer explanation soon. I just wanted to point that out before we get moving on. Uh, nowhere in the text, or the text after that, does it say the angel is incapable of forgiving sin. It simply says, will not forgive your transgressions. He's a malachim. This is a messenger. No one would worship the, a messenger of Hashem. No one would, mess, would worship Michoel. No one would worship Gabriel. Now, I'm not saying to you there are unfortunately lost souls that worship angels, but this is absolutely forbidden. Moreover, the Torah tells, this is, by the way, the clearest text, the clearest text about the angel of the Lord. Clearest. And it says here that this Angel of the Lord, this is this power in heaven, he has no independent agency, and therefore he can't even forgive your sins. So how could Christians marshal this, seize this, exploit this, weaponize this with a sound mind? You, the Christian who does this, you need to repent of this. You claim this is Jesus is the angel of the Lord, or this is the smell. What? Your, you claim from your Gospels that Jesus forgave sins, the paralytic as an example. The Torah openly says that this angel of the Lord cannot forgive sins. That shuts the book on this. Wake up. I'm not going to want bring you proofs from your own Christian Bible, but as it turns out, the book of Hebrews begins by saying that Jesus is not an angel. And the book of Hebrews advances an apologetic of why Jesus is not an angel. An angel doesn't sit at the right hand of God. I don't want to sit here and teach a New Testament. Okay, I knew he would bring this one up. Well, I knew because I watched it, but I wanted to bring it up anyway. Uh, this is the word concept or word fallacy. Just because the word angel is there, and the word angel again is being used in the Old Testament to denote the 
character known as Malach Hashem, as a student or actually a master of Hebrew, Rabbi Singer would know that, and I think he mentioned it earlier, that angel just means messenger. So it can be used in a different context. The angel of the Lord, Malach Hashem in the Old Testament, is not the same being or doesn't even need to be in the same class as, of being as these lesser angels that are found in the or mentioned in the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, so that that's the word fallacy. Just because something has the same name doesn't mean it's the same exact thing. Like there's different uses of the word Lord in the Bible as well. And so these are different uses of the word angel. Malach Hashem in the Old Testament does, says, and is capable of doing things and speaks in a way that no angel would ever speak of if it were a mere created being. We will get to that, but let's just continue. I wanted to point that out as well. It is true that angels are called God literally in Genesis chapter 19, verse 18. It's actually throughout that chapter. What's Genesis chapter 19? The two angels go down to the Sodom with two angels because there are two tasks, one to destroy Sodom and one to rescue Lot and his family. And they're called God throughout the text. That's why at the very end of that chapter, Hashem makes it clear that this sulfur that came down from heaven really is from Hashem. I'm interested that he would bring up Genesis 19 without addressing the Christian, mainly the Orthodox Christian, polemic of that verse. For those of you unaware, I have done a video on this concept. I'm going to bring it back because it was in the old days when I had like 200 subscribers. People might be more interested to hear it now. But uh, in Genesis 18, it does not, he's skipping over the fact that three beings appear to uh, Abraham. So in Genesis 18, it says, three men appeared at the trees of Mamre. And he would immediately jump and say, well, that's three angels then. But actually, if you read the entire chapter 18 and 19, Nowhere, not once, does it ever refer to the third man as an angel. And it's not by accident. It goes out of its way to not refer to the third man as an angel. Does it refer to the other two as angels? Yes, of course. It says that the Lord stayed behind with Abraham, and the two angels went towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Then it picks up again in Genesis 19, and the two angels arrive in Sodom and Gomorrah. So we know that those two are angels, for sure. But the third one is never called an angel. It is called a man at the start of Genesis 18. That's it. Three men appeared by the trees of Mamre. They walked toward Abraham. And then every other mention of this third character is called the Lord. So God. Not just a Lord, by the way. We reference to the fact that in English, Lord can mean a lot of things in the Bible. But when it says Lord here, capital L-O-R-D, it's referring to the divine name, the Tetragrammaton, which the Latinized version that I say on this channel out of respect for the fact that we don't know the true pronunciation of the word, uh, is Jehovah. So, Rabbi Singer was just talking about how there was one Lord in Sodom and one Lord in heaven, and so the one in heaven is raining down fire and brimstone, and he interprets it as God is making it quite clear that the one in Sodom isn't really God, but the one in Sodom is named Jehovah. Secondly, we know from what I just explained that the Lord was present with Abraham, because this third man is never called an angel, it's only called Jehovah, and Abraham begs this being to spare Sodom and Gomorrah and calls him the judge of all that is right or the judge of the entire world. You wouldn't be calling just an angel a judge of the entire world. For a little context, I need to mention the fact that rabbinic Judaism has this theological idea that God cannot enter creation. So any theophany or appearance of God in the Old Testament is interpreted as being a an angelic being, a created being that appears and then God's voice booms out of it. And they use that because they say, well look, angel of the Lord messenger of Hashem, as or Malak Hashem, as he would say, that has to just be a messenger in the most literal way. It can't literally be God. So, and since we already believe that God can't enter creation, we're just going to ignore all these theophanies that are in the Old Testament, where sometimes it doesn't even say that there's an angel at all. Like, again, in, in Genesis 18 and 19, it never says the angel of the Lord. I'm not even talking about the angel of the Lord in this one. It just says the Lord shows up in front of Abraham. But again, their interpretation would be, well, that can't really be him. It has to be the angel. And the angel is a created being, a device in which the voice of God booms out. So that's their theology. I find it interesting that they talk about how Christians go into the Bible already with a Trinitarian bias, but they go in with a Unitarian and even more extensive than that, a God can't enter creation bias, which doesn't make a lot of sense given the theophanies found in the Old Testament. It could make a lot more sense in Islam because they have a different scriptural book. So we can't say, look at this theophany from Genesis, look at this theophany from Exodus. They wouldn't, they wouldn't agree with that because they don't have the same scripture. So their idea of God not, not entering creation, even though I disagree with it, 
makes more sense scripturally than for the Jews to say that, given that we share the same scripture and it's quite evident when reading the plain text that God does enter creation. I wanted to give that context because people don't seem to realize or they're just unaware of what the Jewish beliefs actually are in rabbinic Judaism. Anyway, so when we get to Genesis 19, I've already established that the one that appears as the third one is God and is never called an angel. Uh, that third one, who is still God, is in Sodom and calls down fire and brimstone from another Lord Jehovah in heaven. And they're both called Jehovah, not just the Lord, the generic a Lord. So we know that it's not just that. And we know that since I've already shown the evidence for being God and there is absolutely zero evidence for this third character to be an angel, we can ascertain plurality. One Jehovah with the exact same name in heaven and another Jehovah on earth. And they're both present and they're both called the divine name. And one of them is, is pleaded by Abraham to spare the holy city. So I do believe in Unitarianism and that God duplicates and is in multiple places at once, or you believe in the plurality of God. But to say that the angel of the Lord was present in Genesis 18 and 19 is completely false. Angel of the Lord is never once mentioned. But because a shliach, a a angel is acting, acting at the behest of God, so angels are called God. Prophets are called God. Isaiah is called Yud Kevavke, the Shem Hashem. Where? In Isaiah 7, verse 10. It, Ahaz was not a prophet, and he's talking to Isaiah, and instead of it saying that Isaiah responded to Ahaz, it says that Hashem responded to Ahaz. How is that? In Tanakh, there is a convention that is unconventional today. There's a linguistic convention where those, whether it's an angel of Hashem or a prophet or in Exodus 21 and 22, judges are called God. I'm not kidding. It says you'll bring people before a judge. The word there is Elohim. And in Psalm 82 verse 6, Judges are called God. Uh, again, this is the word concept fallacy. Uh, the word God that he's saying. So he's saying that it's the word Elohim. Elohim means God or the God. Uh, it does not actually mean God's divine name, which is Jehovah. Uh, for instance, there's a time when God refers to Moses as, See, I have made you a God in front of Pharaoh. But we know that Moses is not an uncreated deity. We know that he, he was, he's a created mortal man. And so he cannot be a deity. And we know that in the context, these judges are also not Jehovah, nor are they even called Jehovah. They're called gods or a god. So there's a representation of God, but he's not a character in Greek. And so I bring up character because uh, in the New Testament, Christ is called the character of God the Father. And that means the exact impression. And none of these people are exact impressions of God. Because in order to be the exact representation and exact copy, it's like a photocopy of God, you would also have to be uncreated, all-powerful, and all-knowing. And since none of these judges, mortal men, Moses, etc., are uncreated, all-powerful, all-knowing, or came from heaven, then they are not the same as God at all. They are not actually gods. It's a literary device, as he says. He admits it. But then he goes a little further to imply any reference of all at all of God appearing anywhere is just another one of these. But he's missing not missing, but he's intentionally mischaracterizing the difference between Elohim, a god, and the actual name for God, which he will refer to as Hashem. And Hashem in Hebrew just means the name, and uh, that name, of course, is Jehovah. So the difference between being called a god in a literary symbolic sense and then actually being God. On one hand, Christians will go, up. Oh, there's another divine being in heaven, thus undermine the radical monotheism baked into Tanakh, see? But when they want it the other way, what do they want? In Galatians 3, Paul seeks to undermine the authority of the Torah of Moses, and he, he juxtaposes the law of Moses against the covenant that God made with Abraham because he's against the keeping of the law. He's antinomian, it means the ritual law. So what does he do? He puts in nonsense that the Torah was given by angels, just the opposite, you see? And Luke will do the same thing. Where does that come from? Nonsense. So if it works for them here, they know an angel is not God, and then they weaponize that. 
And then when they when they want to defend the doctrine of Trinity, which is indefensible, they'll weaponize that. They then weaponize professors in the academic world who don't believe in the divine authorship of the Torah, the mosaic, or the, and they'll seize that. Isn't that an embarrassment to Christians that they should do that? So let's be careful of that. So there are powers, and an angel has power, but the power is only, as the Torah says, kishmi bikirboi, because my name is in him. But the angel doesn't have independent agency, and therefore, la yisa lifsha'achem, he will not forgive your sins. Well, how would you tell me that this is Jesus? I'm openly quoting from the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 20 and 21. I plead with Christians, read this, seize this, drink this, inhale this, and repent of this idolatry and return back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thank you for your question. Okay, I think we've heard enough. Uh, tried to cut through the video because there's a lot of kind of goes on a tangent to a different subject, which if you're interested, go ahead and watch it. I'm not going to say you can't watch it or anything, uh, but let's let's now get into a deep, a deep dive. I was only interjecting with quick points here and there, but now we have to get kind of serious. So, Tovi Singer is claiming a few things. He's claiming that the idea of two divine powers was not present in Judaism at all. He only refers to the Tanakh, and he doesn't actually reference the book at all, which is called Two Powers in Heaven, which I found interesting. Uh, because the book, written by secular historian, also Two Gods in Heaven and Temple Theology, all written by secular historians, not Christian believers, so you can't say it has a Christian bias. Uh, all of them believe in a plurality of God found in ancient Judaism, and their sources are not just the Bible, but ancient Judaic texts outside of the Bible and other historical and archaeological findings from the region and from thousands of years ago. So I found it a bit interesting that he didn't actually address the book itself. Maybe he hadn't read it. He doesn't have to address it. I just thought it was very interesting, uh, but also it's supported in the book Two Gods in Heaven and in Margaret Barker's Temple Theology, you can see how the worship of the angel of the Lord as a second power in heaven was cemented in ancient Judaism and is not a creation of a post-Christian identity. In addition to that, there is a book by a, a Jewish professor, not a Christian again, called Benjamin D. Sommer. I mentioned him so many times on this channel, I feel he should be sponsored. And uh, Benjamin D. Sommer has a book called, I think, Bodies of God in Ancient Israel, where he talks about the plurality of God found in the Old Testament. He argues anybody who is saying the Trinity is, is a, a proto-Greco-Roman idea is being uh, disingenuous. He's also saying that Jews have no theological right quoting him exactly here, Jews have no theological right to oppose the Trinity because of the multi-personal uh, developments in their theology as well. Now, some of it is post-ancient Judaism. Some, some of it's a little later, like Kabbalah and um, the Sefirot, which is 10 in 1, so compared to the Trinity, it's a lot more complicated. But even if we ignore the later developments in, in Judaism, which came after Neoplatonism, and we go back to the root of ancient Judaism, even at that time, all of these authors, including Samer, agree that there is a multi-personal God being worshipped, and that it is in fact an ancient Semitic custom, not custom, an ancient Semitic tradition, and that it was copied by a lot of other polytheist neighbors to the Jews, including some of the people and uh, some findings in Ugarit, which is in northwestern Syria, and uh, other Semitic, East Semitic peoples as well, more in Mesopotamia. And so the idea of having a uh, trifold singular god is not something that was invented by Greco-Romans. I see also a lot of weird videos where people would claim, oh, look, look, the three deities were worshipped in ancient Greece or Egypt. But again, those are that's tritheism. It's three gods. So if you really want to compare it, you'd have to find people that do not believe in tritheism, but in trifold monotheism. So in Trinitarianism, a, a personal, multi-personal god. And the only people who have that are the neighbors of the Jews who happen to copy the work of the Jews. So it's not a Greco-Roman idea. Um, the other books, not including Sommer, talk a lot about, again, the worship of the angel of the Lord and a second power throughout the first and second temple era. So unless Tovia is willing to just throw that, all that out and say, oh, those don't count, the temple's useless, and this is a really significant part of Judaism, and uh, he seems to just glide over the book and go directly into the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament. Uh, I also found, like I said, we talked about Genesis 18 and 19 already. He seemed to make a lot of comparisons using, again, the word concept fallacy. The word and angel appeared somewhere in the New Testament, therefore cannot be Christ. 
and Christ is not an angel in that in that way so therefore Christ cannot be the pre-incarnate Christ cannot be the angel of the Lord but again that fallacy doesn't make a lot of sense um, people also would say that the angel of the Lord shows up in the New Testament in the Gospels but he doesn't it just says an angel of the Lord so context is always important and again angel just means messenger so a little messenger could be a created being of God who serves God eternally not eternally but after being created serves God for the rest of time and then the Malak Hashem the word messenger could be used completely differently and I'm going to point out why that's different so we already covered Genesis 18 to 19 Tovia Singer brought up Exodus uh, 2320 and 2321 to say that the angel cannot and has no free agency cannot forgive sins but the plain text doesn't say any of that again he's reading that confirmation bias into the text the text itself purely just states my name is in him he will not forgive your transgressions that's it he will not forgive your transgressions now that would be enough for Tovia to say look that can't be Christ Christ a can't be an angel because look at Hebrews but again we already covered that and B he can't be the angel because the angel can't even forgive sins but Christ did but I already covered that as well because the plain text doesn't say it if we go back to Exodus 3 when Moses who by the way is the author of the entire Torah first five books of the Bible they are all written by Moses end of story so if Moses is the author which Jews agree with Rabbi Tovia agrees with that I think he mentions it in the video as well then Moses knows what he's talking about when he's writing about himself in the third person he wouldn't say something theologically untrue just to make a good story my example would be in Exodus 3 here we see that when Moses encounters God and by the way when Moses encounters God in the burning bush he specifically encounters Malak Hashem, the angel of the Lord. Halfway through their conversation, he stops referring to the angel of the Lord as the angel of the Lord and just says, and God said, and Moses replied, and then God said this, and Moses said that. So he stops using angel of the Lord. He only uses it in the first few passages. Um, but when he's first appearing there and he hears the, the voice of God, he turns away and, and writing in the third person, Moses literally says, and Moses turned away because he was afraid to look upon God. So keeping in mind that Moses wrote this book, he wouldn't, and he wrote this book, by the way, on Mount Sinai, that's the tradition. So after receiving all the cosmology and theology from God, he writes these awe-inspiring, Holy Spirit-breathed books. And uh, in that, he writes that Moses was afraid of God. So why would he lie, write something false theologically when God was not physically there? Why wouldn't he point out that this angel is not in fact God, but he treats it like God? Are there other examples of Moses' writings in the Torah that other people meet the angel of the Lord and refer to it as God, of course. If you look at the encounter between Hagar and the angel of the Lord, after Hagar has, is done speaking to the angel of the Lord, the angel, or sorry, Hagar refers to the angel as, you are the God who sees. Not you are some created messenger who saw me, thank you for sending this word from God, but you are the God who sees. That is the name that Hagar calls the area, named after the angel of the Lord. Then when we have uh, the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel, when they are done wrestling, Jacob pulls away and he says, he names the place after God and says, you are the God who I've seen face to face, or I have seen God face to face, and he survived. So we have Hagar saying, this angel is literally God, and God saw me. Jacob saying, I saw God face to face and I didn't die. Moses saying, there was God in the burning bush. I had to turn away because I was afraid. And Moses is, of course, the author of all these books. So he would not be saying something that is theologically untrue just to confuse his own, his own audience. Uh, so I find the idea that the angel cannot be God to be poor because he didn't mention the verses that Christians actually care about. He brought up Exodus 23 as a rebuttal, but he didn't bring up what he was rebutting, which was Exodus 3 and... Uh, the remainder of the stories of Jacob and Hagar where they are seeing the angel of the Lord. Those are the ones that we're mentioning. Why didn't he bring them up? And then later, uh, I believe in the book of Judges, Gideon meets the angel of the Lord and he proclaims, I'm going to die because I've seen God. And the character, Malak Hashem, angel of the Lord, says, no, you're not. Does not ever clarify and says, no, you're not because I'm not God. I'm just a messenger. Don't worry. That's not what it says. It just says, God told him, don't worry. Angel of the Lord told him, don't worry. Not going to kill you. So Gideon knew he was seeing God. Hagar knew she was seeing God. Moses knew that he had seen God. Jacob knew that he had wrestled and seen God. These are all prophets and they're all being written by the God-inspired, holiest prophet of all time, Moses himself, who is saying all these things. So for Tovia to ignore that, I found was a little strange. And it's disingenuous to the actual Christian polemic. And then again, he didn't seem to mention the idea of the actual 
content in the books which you should check out. There are books talking about the worship of two powers throughout the temple period. And even a Jewish man himself, Benjamin Sommer, talks about it in his book. So I think that this was not a very great rebuttal against the idea of two powers. I'm not saying he's incapable of doing it, but he just chose to stick to some out of context Old Testament verses and a bit of New Testament, rather than address A, the historical secular books by historians, or the actual verses that we Christians are using against them. Because we're not showing up with Exodus 23. We're showing up with Exodus 3, and we're showing up with Genesis 18 and 19, and we're showing up with the Gospel of John, and he doesn't seem to mention any of that. So, that's my rebuttal of Rabbi Tovia Singer's video on the two powers. Um, you can check out his channel if you want to see the rest of his content. And uh, as always, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you had a problem with the video, let me know. Or don't. And then uh, if you guys have any more ideas for videos, hit me up on Discord, Twitter, or in the comments section. Thank you all for watching, and God bless.